My guest today is Louis Gave of the firm Gavacal. Did I pronounce everything correctly? All good. Glad Great. to be here. Thanks. Thanks a bunch for having me, Professor. <laughs> my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I was just telling Louis that I've been a consumer of the research that his firm produces, mainly about emerging markets and China for, I want to say almost 10 years. I've probably, probably been reading your stuff for about that long and um, have always admired the analytical clarity of you and your team. And uh, I, I really, uh, I had actually tried to get you on the podcast yeah. for some time, and but I didn't have a good contact uh, info from you. And I actually got it from someone else who had interv interviewed me about China from another firm, so uh, uh, an institutional investor. So um, anyway, that's how I finally got you on the show. So sorry about that, but glad I'm here now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great to have you. Now, you have, I've heard you talk a little bit about your background in the past, and I would kind of classify it as a colorful background. Uh, let me just say a few things for the audience, and then we can just uh, digress a little bit into your recollections of your childhood and growing up. Um, you attended Duke University. You also learned Mandarin at Nanjing University. You served in the French military, in the infantry even, as a lieutenant. I did. I'm French, you worked at, so just to, just to yes, be clear. Yes, and you're origi originally <laughs> French, uh, and you, you worked at Banque Paribas for some years before starting your own firm, which is based in Hong Kong. Yes, that's right. And uh, so no, let's, you, let's go right. Yeah. So let's fill in those gaps. So, so you were probably, I'm guessing you were raised in France and how did you end up in college in the United States? Um, so yeah, no, I was, I was born in France. Both my parents are French. Um, when I was a junior in high school, they sent me to the U S for three months to sort of learn English. Um, and so I went off and I came back and I was enthused with, with the U S and I told my parents, look, I, I want to, um, I want to study in the U S. Um, and my dad said, well, look, um, uh, I'll pay for it if, but on these conditions, it's, it's gotta be a top 10 school. Um, it's gotta be on the East coast cause the West coast is too far from France. And, um, and it can't be in a, in a big city. Cause you know, back in the early nineties, um, you know, well, if you were living in Europe, you had this vision of American cities as being quite dangerous. I guess things go in cycle because yep. then they became super safe and now we're back to being dangerous again. So, so and it can't be in a city. So that, that sort of narrowed it down, right? There, there weren't a lot of schools that, that ticked all those boxes. Uh, so I applied to the schools that did, did tick these boxes and I got into Duke uh, and I'm really grateful that I did because I, I had a wonderful four years there. I made uh, some, to this day, some of my best friends. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it, it opened up my, my eyes to a whole other part of the world. And, you know, when I got to Duke, I had the opportunity to study Chinese, uh, which, which I picked up and that opened up my eyes further to a whole other part of the world. Now, when you were that age, what, what did you want to do in life? Did you have an idea of your, what your career trajectory was going to be? Yeah, actually I wanted to be an army officer. Um, I come from a, a family where basically everybody's an army officer. My dad was the one exception. Um, my grand, my grandparents, great grandparents, uncles, everybody being army officers. Um, and maybe not forever, but at least for a while. And I thought, okay, well, you know, this is, um, this is a fun career. Um, so, so that that was always my, my sort of, my sort of object, objective. And when I graduated from Duke, I went back to France. I went to officer school in France. Um, and when I graduated, actually, um, so, you know, I went into my battalion and very quickly I, I was sort of pushed to go into NATO, um, you know, because France was in the process of rejoining NATO. So the, and I was told, oh, look, you can you can go live in Brussels and, you know, be part of this. And this is all very exciting. And I thought, well, hold on. Uh, I want to be in the army to run around, uh, run around the mountains with a rifle. Um, I don't really want to be stuck in a desk job, or at least if I'm going to be stuck in a desk job, I'd, uh, I'd rather make some better money. Um, cause there's a lot of great things in the army, but the money is definitely not one of them. Um, and so I, um, after a while I decided, okay, if I'm going to be shoved into a desk job because I speak English, because my Chinese, et cetera, then I'd rather do something else. And so how long was your commitment in the military and how long did it take you to decide that the military was not going to be your full, your so, lifetime career? To be honest, so I was there for, for two years um, and uh, I, I was planning to stay longer. 
um, here, the, the, the thing was, I was, I was playing to say longer, but while I was there, I found that all the young officers, the, the lieutenants, the captains were full of life, full of beans, having a great time. And, and the, when I looked at the senior officers, you know, the colonels, the majors, uh, they all seemed quite grumpy and quite uh, almost resentful. Uh, and because I think that the job of a young officer is super fun, you're leading men, you're, you know, again, you're running around the fields with a rifle. Uh, and the job of an, a senior officer all too often is, is A, both very political and B, very, um, uh, it's a lot of paperwork. Um, so, uh, and you get to move from, you know, crappy town to crappy town and get paid very little money and your wife's upset at you and all these things. So, um, so as I was in the army, I realized uh, maybe this, this isn't a great long-term career plan. Um, and I was there at a time when the French army had started to professionalize because we used to have a conscript army up until the early 90s. And that, that was probably the one promise, electoral promise that Chirac kept was to, to do away with uh, the military service, which I think it ended up being a disaster, but that's a whole other topic. Um, the, um, uh, so he got away with conscription. So I was there, uh, basically the army was professionalizing. And as a result, we were the French army was a little bit like the Mexican army, we just had too many officers because uh -huh. we were, you know, we, we like we were meant to have all these soldiers and we didn't have them anymore. Uh, so the army was actually happy. If you would, if you told them, look, I've got a job offer somewhere else. They're like, go, you know, good luck to you. Um, you know, even if they paid for your training, even if they, they were just happy to see you go, they had too many of so us it, anyway. It worked out. It worked out very well for you then. Cause it, it might've been the case that you were locked into a long commitment and wanted out, but they, they kind of let you out when you wanted out. Exactly. No, no, they worked out great. And, um, you know, part, uh, you know, the, the head of HR at Paribas, where I got my first job came from my battalion, which, you know, helped. Um, and so, yeah, so it, it was all, it was, it was good. Now, one last and question. Before to this day, I, and I tell them, sorry, so I, I want to add this. I, I, I tell this to my boys who have absolutely no interest in the army, but I tell them, look, I, I learned more in the army in terms of relationship with people, in terms of relationship with staff. And I, the army basically made me the man I am, I think, much more so than, than college, actually. Um, so when I think of the money spent for college and the money, you know, <laughs> well, I guess the money I, I did make in the army, but uh, it was, it's, it's a valuable experience that I would definitely recommend to any young men or women not quite sure what they want to do which is where I was at 21. I wasn't exactly sure what do I want to be? What do I want to do? It, it gives you time to think and it gives you time to mature into, I think, a better human being, actually. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. I mean, I think the leadership skills, uh, working with a team, working with a team that might be under life and death situations, you know, obviously that's got to be uh, a very special experience. You're not going to find that in very many other places. Yeah, no, no, it, it was, I, and you, you get to meet terrific people. Uh, you get you get to meet also real d d dimwits. You know, you get to you get to meet yeah. the the gambit. My my grandfather, who was also like he did his whole life in the army, would would, would always say, you know, look, not everybody in, is stupid in the army, but that's definitely where all the stupid people go. Um, and <laughs> and you know, my when I was when I was a cap uh, when I was in sorry when I was in uh, at officer school, our training captain would always tell us, and he was right, and it served me very well in my whole life. He, he would always tell me, look, what is self-evident to you, there's a 95% chance that it's not self-evident to anybody, to, to most of the people that are going to serve under you. Um, so your instructions have to be super clear. Uh, you can repeat them three times because, you know, the reality is if you're a smart kid and you go to a, a good high school, and then, which it was my, you know, I'd like to think I was a smart kid and I went to a very good high school. And from there, I went to Duke. Like, I'd always been around smart people, like my whole life. Uh, I'd always been around, you know, people who were ambitious, driven, and obviously high IQs, high EQs, like all these things. Uh, but that's not how life is in the rest of the world. That's not, you know, in, you know, if you live in a fairly sheltered environment, you don't, perhaps you, you don't get confronted to the fact that actually there's a much broader gambit of experiences and of skills um, and that it, it takes all this gambit to, to get things done. Um, and the army really teaches you that because in the army, I met some of the smartest people I've ever met, but also some of the dumbest. 
And then you got to get all these people to work together. Yeah, you know, the, the slightly weaker version of that experience is, is, is playing on sports teams because um, you meet a somewhat wider intellectual spectrum of kids and, you know, you, you do things under stress, like compete against other teams. So, you know, for those of you who can't find the military as part of your career path, you know, join a sports team and compete. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's a very fair point. That's a very fair point. And I'm a big believer in uh, team sports for kids as well, actually. I've, uh, I've pushed, I have four kids. And I've pushed all four of them to to pick a team sport. Now, there's one I like more, so I try to push them into that one. But if they want to pick another one, I don't really care as long as they play a team sport. Yeah, maybe at the end, if we have a little free time, we'll talk rugby. I know you're a rugby <laughs> guy. I'm a fo- I'm an American football guy, so yeah, well, we can talk about that at the end. There we go. Well, there's there's, um, there's similarities. Yeah. One one military question I want to ask you just before we get off the topic: How do you feel about the bullpup design for an assault rifle? Better or worse than the traditional? <laughs> you used the bullpup um, in France. The, um, we used the FAMAS, the Fusil Automatique de la Manufacture d'Armes de Saint-Etienne, which um, was, is a great rifle because you can uh, shoot one bullet at a time, three bullets at a time, or unlimited. Uh, so, you know, you can go full automatic. Um, and... Um, and to this day, I still think it's one of the best rifles out there. You know, if you're a halfway decent shot, you can you can hit a plate 250 yards away. Um, so I don't know what's uh, what's your take. What's the well, you best know, rifle out there? And by the way, it's funny. And the yeah. FAMAS, it, it it works in different conditions. It works in the desert. It works in the jungles. Um, you know, with the French Army, we have a history of of being you know. All up and down, all up and down in Africa, different environment, etc. So we need a rifle that's that's uh, that's resilient, robust, um, and robust. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Fragile. I don't know nearly as much as you. I mean, I, I have an AR, but um, and that's the kind of rifle that I grew up shooting. You know, with the with the with the the magazine in front. But as a kid, I'll tell you this funny story, which you know maybe isn't surprising for a physicist, is that when I was a little kid and I was learning about muzzle velocity and you know because i was i was into guns when i was growing up i grew up in iowa so i I did a lot of hunting and stuff and i learned that like you want to have this longer barrel so you can have a higher muzzle velocity more power in in the bullet and i said why don't we put the magazine as far back as we can because then you have a shorter overall length of the weapon but you can still get the full muzzle velocity and that's that's what a bullpup is but i've never shot a bullpup and i hear a lot of americans are against bullpups but you know israelis u- use them and I, french use them for a long time british so what, chinese even so why are they, yeah. why are they why are they why is americans against them you know if you watch it's is so it funny on you there's no. so much content now on youtube you can watch guys trying out all kinds of guns and stuff like tabors and, yeah, yeah. and and usually they're complaining well number one like the active mechanism is a little too close to your head like they're a little worried about oh. that and um, yeah. also, um, I think they, I don't know, I, I feel like having the weight back makes the gun, it's more easy to reposition the gun. So it seems ergonomically better. I feel like an AR is a little top, is a little front heavy, actually, when I carry, you know, when you carry it, you're, you're kind of supporting the weight up front. Yeah, yeah. So I like bullpups, but a lot of Americans don't. It's, it's strange. I, so I've actually never shot an AR. Uh, so I, uh, I, I don't know. I'm actually not a huge, huge weapons guy. I loved being in the army, um, but I don't even own guns today, to be honest. Um, Probably not easy in Hong Kong. Can't. It's, yeah, you can't. Uh, yeah. You, you, you can't. Well, yeah, I mean, you can. You can join a gun club, but they keep the club of the gun club. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's really, really tightly controlled. In Michigan, um, if you're, in Michigan, if you're 18, you can walk into a store and walk out with an AR. <laughs> so that's America for you. So, uh, yeah, different, different, different cultures. Yep. Um, but yeah, so, you know, in the past uh, 25 years, I've lived in Hong Kong. So the whole, the whole gun culture has sort of pa- passed me by a little bit. Right. So let's, let's jump ahead and talk about your founding Gavacal and the opportunity maybe was, you thought there was a lot of opportunity emerging markets. It wasn't covered sufficiently. Maybe, maybe tell that story a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I was working at Paribas, um, and um, so I started at Paribas in Paris, and I was very lucky because they 
sort of typical French bank fashion, they bought a Pan-Asian broker. Uh, it took them 18 months to close the deal and the deal closed on uh, June 1st, 1997. So I was sent over with my boss to do the integration. My boss was the head of research um, uh, f uh, for France and he became head of research for Asia and he was sent over to do the integration. So I, I go with him, you know, because he's like, oh, you speak English, you speak Chinese, come over with me. Um, and, I, you know, I was gagging to go, of course. Um, then uh, I saw you laugh, but maybe some of your auditors won't know that July 1st, so a month after the transaction closed, July 1st, 1997, is when the Thai bot devalues, which kicks off the Asian crisis. Um, and the Asian crisis, if you didn't live through it, was, was really quite something. I remember um, calling my dad as, as it was unfolding. They were, we had like six weeks where the Indonesian rupiah was falling 10 to 15% every day. Now, this is a currency, not a stock. You know, there was the stock market was also falling 15% a day. A lot of the stocks were falling, were opening, limit down, close, and then start again the next day, limit down, close. Because um, there were sort of limits you could hit 10 or 15% typically. And if you fell that much, the stock was closed for the day, and then you'd start again the next day. Um, and anyway, so the currency itself was down 10 to 15% a day. I think I'm quoting from memory. I think the Indonesian rupiah ended up going down 92%. Uh, over the over the period, well, it was from two thousand three hundred to nineteen thousand, whatever that makes. Um, you're the physicist; you can probably calculate it in your head. Uh, but uh, you know, the Thai bot ended going down six, falling two thirds. The Malaysian ringgit, the Korean won. It was an absolute absolute bloodbath, and and the equity in a lot of these companies were completely wiped out because most people had debt in U.S. dollars. Um, so anyway, Asia's this bloodbath. Um, which, you know, when you're starting off your career is actually a blessing uh, because first you don't have too many responsibilities. So, you know, as your business is bleeding everywhere, that's not your fault. Um, and you didn't make any bad decisions. You just got here. Um, and so that, that was number one. Number two, it's a blessing because you, you realize how quickly things can unravel. And so for me, it was a great formative experience. But long story short, um, as Asia imploded, most investment banks sh shut down, you know, like decided, all right, this place is a disaster zone. Let's cut our costs, pack out and leave. And so the research budgets of every uh, major firm by 2000, 2001 were basically down to nothing. Um, and this is just when then China entered the WTO. Now, remember at, at that point, China is, is a nobody. Uh, like nobody really cares. Uh, but if you're living there, you know, and you're seeing what's happening, it's pretty obvious this is going to be a really big deal. You know, they're, they're making the right investments. They're investing in their infrastructure. Um, you can see all the foreign companies opening um, uh, plants there. Um, then then you, see, you know that with the WTO, it's going to go into hyperdrive. So the road seemed well traced, uh, and yet nobody was there really talking about it. So, you know, my father, Anatole, uh, my business partner, Anatole Kaleski, myself thought, okay, this is you know, there's, there's a niche here in the market, in essence. Um, China's going to be really important. Nobody's looking at it. We can be the we can be the guys who explain China to Westerners, in essence, uh, since the investment banks don't, don't even seem interested in doing it anymore. Um, and we got lucky because, yeah, it was the, the right wave to surf. You know, for roughly 10, 12 years, China did become the really, really big thing in the, in the global economy. Um, now, it isn't the case anymore for a number of reasons. Um, and there's other exciting stories out there, uh, but yeah, it was a case of, you know, right place, right time. And so, yeah, we set up in Hong Kong and, you know, back in 2001, 2000, post-Asian crisis, Hong Kong was a super cheap place to operate from. Um, very light regulatory touch, very easy to start a business, very easy to run a business. Um, and yeah, it just, just worked out. Would you still say that now? So even after the handover, is it still an easy place to run a business? Well, I would say that everywhere in the world today is harder to run a business than 20 years ago. Uh, almost, yeah. almost. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of regulations, you know, if you compare, if you're in London, if you're in New York, if you're in Paris, everybody complains that today is harder than 20 years ago. Um, and in that respect, the same is true of Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is still easier than New York, London, Paris, et cetera. And it's easier on, on many fronts. Um, first, it's easier on taxation. Hong Kong still has, you know, for me, 
the, 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 the best system where you, you, you fill out your taxes on a postcard. It's, you know, how much, how much did you earn? Uh, you know, a couple deductions for charity, et cetera, and medical expenses and um, um, education expenses. Um, taxable income, send us 16%. Boom. I mean, it literally fits fits on the fits on the postcard and you know same same income tax rate for corporates as for individuals so there's no reason to try to you know do things here or do things there it uh it, it very simple so on a, that part has not changed hong kong is still uh you know it's not a tax haven but it's a literally a tax paradise because it makes things easy to run yep um when when you compare it to the u.s where there's deductions for this deductions for that and it's uh, it's it's so complicated in the U.S. that you need like a Ph. a guy who's taken a Ph.D. to do your taxes. A lot of uh, it's funny, funny story. Uh, Bill Gates went to Harvard originally to study math. And one of his roommates, he had actually been really good at math in high school. And one of his roommates turned out to be better at Harvard, a guy called Andy Braderman. And that guy scared Gates out of the math major and into the CS major. And people ask, what happened to Andy Braderman? Tax attorney. And he's like, tax attorney. Yeah, it's I, I, you know what? I, I, I believe it. I think if you take all the all the tax, the people who who prepare uh, taxes uh, in in the U.S., um, I think it's uh, it's the sixth law. It'd be the sixth largest employer in the U.S. Yeah, it's insane. Um, and and you know, and most of these people here's you know when you think of it, it's such a poor misallocation of resources, right? Most of these people, like you just said, like super smart guy at Harvard. Um, like I'm sure, I'm sure he gets paid very well and he does very well. But what a poor use of resources as a society, right? That we got a guy who's a genius uh, who's doing people's taxes. I mean, that's that's just stupid. I, I kind of knew I kind of knew one of the bubbles had been reached around 2006, 2007 because I was having sushi with an, a former physics guy who was in finance, a derivatives guy. We're sitting there eating this whatever two hundred dollar sushi dinner thing, and two little dudes are sitting next to us, talking about some derivatives contract which was being executed purely for tax purposes, and just like, well, this is this is too much. Like too much brain power is going into this right now. So, absolutely, absolutely. So, so on that front, Hong Kong is still great. Like nobody bothers with these schemes of like, oh, maybe if I finance a movie, I can write this off, et cetera. Yeah. And then you end up producing a terrible movie. There's none of that. <laughs> so that's good. Um, there's on um, on the labor laws. I still think Hong Kong is terrific. Uh, you can hire people easily. You can you know, fire people, uh, which is uh, if the tax code is America's comparative disadvantage, the labor laws are France's comparative mm. disadvantage. Yes. Because you can't fire um, anybody, right? You know, it's you can't you can't fire anybody. Like I, I think the tax code in the U.S. is like seventeen thousand pages or something. The labor co code in France is like thirty thousand pages. Um, you, you can't you can't do anything. Um, so so that in Hong Kong, that's still a paradise for that, no doubt. Uh, and then you get into the financial regulation, where Hong Kong, like everybody else, has has had to, to tighten meaningfully. Um, and but I think that's everywhere around the world. Yep. So it's still a good place. It's still a good place overall. So, so you've been a, a keen observer of China and other emerging markets from your perch in Hong Kong. Um, and let's just get into it. So if I follow the Western media today, they tell me China is collapsing. If I turn on Gavacal, I learn, wait a minute, their monthly trade surplus is $80 billion. It, It's on an annualized run rate. It's a trillion dollar trade surplus. If I turn into Steve Shu's Tune into Steve Shu's podcast, who's interviewing technologists and scientists. I learned that in space, semiconductors, uh, jet engines, electric vehicles, solar panels, they're at parity or beyond parity with the West now in all those areas. So who has the story right? Um, well, Steve Shu definitely has the story right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me just say, um, so... One of my favorite philosophers, a, a, a Christian philosopher of the 16th century, a guy called Jean Baudin, who would say, the only wealth is man. Uh, the only wealth is people. Um, now, when I studied in China in uh, the early 90s, China was graduating 300,000 university students a year. Uh, today, China graduates this year, sorry, last year, it's graduated 11 and a half million. And this year, it's going to graduate about 12.3 million people. Uh, that's a 30x in one generation. Yep. In terms of, 
and going going to your point about you know the progress made on semiconductors, the progress made on space, on computers, etc. Um, you know, China now graduates every year more engineers than there are in the United States. Than there are engineers in the United States now. We could debate all day, yes, but the Chinese universities don't have the same levels as the U.S. universities, and we're, we're comparing apples and oranges, etc. But the point I'd make is. 30 years ago, you were graduating 300,000 guys. And even if the 12 million guys you're now graduating are not the same level as your 12 million guys from the University of Michigan or the, the you know, Harvard that you mentioned or Duke or et cetera, um, that's still a whole lot better than plowing fields with uh, behind a horse. Yeah. Right? You know, so, so the – sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I was going to say I've been a professor right. pro for 30 years, and so I've seen the whole arc – of what you describe, where at the beginning, if you wanted to get a world-class science education, at least at the graduate level, you had to leave China and come out here. There were no world-class research labs in China. Fast forward to today, there are many Chinese universities with top flight departments across the board in STEM subjects. And about twice the fraction of kids of that 11 million that you described, the percentage of their doing STEM is twice as high as in the United States. So overall, you just get this enormous tidal wave of human capital that's feeding into their system. And their, their K through 12 grads are pretty good. So basically now they can get all the way up to world-class frontier, you know, research level training at their domestic universities, which even 10 years ago, they couldn't do that, but now they can. So the, the, all this stuff is compounding. You can just see it in how young the teams are over there that are doing this world-class work, whether it's in jet engines or satellites or computers. So um that that human capital thing is for real. It's not going to go away for decades. So on this, so I, I completely agree with you, but if if I was the US, so perhaps one worrying statistic is if you take the, the, the very best Chinese universities, your Beida, your Tsinghua, your Fudan, uh, your Nandas, um, they used to send a lot of university graduates uh, to the US. Uh, so you do the undergrads there and then to your point, you'd come to Michigan to do a master's or a PhD in, you know, physics or chemistry or whatever. Um, those numbers have been in free fall. Uh, now, initially, you thought, okay, it's COVID. You know, like nobody's moving. It's hard to, to, to get out of the country, et cetera. But even post-COVID, there's been no rebound. Um, now, you could say, well, it's the economic difficulties in China or or – uh, it's actually, I can now do a very good PhD in chemistry at Tsinghua, uh, which I think is actually what it is. I don't need to spend all this money yeah. to go to, to, to go. If I'm a top, top guy, I don't need to spend all this money to go to Michigan. I can go to Tsinghua. You know, um, you know, Louis, you, yeah, you went through the pain of having to learn Mandarin. Right? So imagine how painful it would have been for you at 22 to say, oh my God, the only place I can do my PhD in material science is at Tsinghua, and now I got to be fully fluent. I got to read all my textbooks in Mandarin. I yes. Talk, I got to network with my job recruiter in Mandarin. I got to do everything in Mandarin. There are plenty of people in China that are great scientists, but their English isn't that great. So why would they come here, right? It's such a burden for them to come here that they can, if there is an ecosystem for them to develop their skills and to practice what they learned in school in China, they're obviously going to favor that once, once the system is mature. So I, and and so I think to your point, I think we're, we've reached that point in China now, um, and I think that that's a change that we perhaps underestimate. We in the Western world underestimate because we just take it for granted that we have the best universities in the world, uh, and that of course, if you're smart, you want to go to Harvard, and of course, once you're in Harvard, you're never going to move back to China because why would you? Yeah. Um, and and that would because in fairness, that was always the case for a hundred years or for. I, at least the post World War II environment, that was the case, and I don't know if it still is. I don't know if it's still the case in the, the past. I think five, it's. Six I years. think it's. It's just tipping now. So, and 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 obviously for the bulk of students who aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily have the choice of going to Stanford or Tsinghua, but it's some other good Chinese university and then some other, you know, reasonably good U.S. university. I think more they're much more likely to stay in China now than they certainly than they were even a few years ago. Yeah. So I think that's to answer your question. That that's you know the, the first point I wanted to highlight because again, I think it's uh, you know perhaps people aren't aware of it in, in the Western world. Now, the second point I'd make 
you know, on the whole, oh, China's imploding and um, is, you know, what I find, what I find fascinating is in my career, so I'm 50 years old, uh, just, but in my career, basically every time you've had a real estate bust, you had a big economic implosion. Banks, you know, went belly up and uh, you had big rises in unemployment and big deflationary busts in your economy. And that was the case for Japan in the early 90s. That was the case we mentioned it in, uh, well, that was the case in Sweden in 92, in Canada in 94. It was a case all, all across Southeast Asia in 97. Obviously, the U.S. in 2008 is still fresh in a lot of people's mind. Um, well, frankly, Southern Europe in 2011, 2012. Um, real estate has now been consolidating in China for five years, four or five years, um, for a number of reasons. You know, obviously, trees don't grow the sky, but also the government actively wanted to take down real estate. They took down real estate. Um, affordability has gone from, you know, being the most expensive in 20 years to the cheapest in 20 years over the past five years. Uh, partly because mortgage rates have halved, partly because real estate prices have gone down about 20, 30%. And at the same time, over that same five year period, incomes have come up 20, 30%. So, you know, you do your affordability ratio, all of a sudden it looks much better. Um, and so China has managed to do a real estate consolidation, which has, you know, hurt growth, which has, you know, killed the sort of like raw, raw feeling the Chinese economy had, but the Chinese economy has not imploded. You know, the show's kept on the road. You haven't had armies of unemployed showing up in cities uh, looking for work. Uh, nobody's gone hungry. Um, you haven't had a fentanyl crisis. Uh, you know, it's like you, the economy has been adjusting for the past four or five years to a, to a different economy in, in fairness. But I think we have the knee-jerk reaction in the Western world of, oh, there's been a real estate bubble. The real estate bubble is imploding. Therefore, it's all going to go to pot. Therefore, you know, the, all, everything's going to implode because that's what happened to us. So how could it not happen to them? <laughs> um, right? I mean, we, we're just projecting our own experiences onto, onto China. So could we, could we talk a little bit about the structural differences here? So um, I think I've heard you mention that the, roughly speaking, the kind of bad debt overhang is on the order of $2 trillion. Is that, is that fair? Yep. And they're working that through the system. Lo would love to hear your opinion about, you know, where they, whether they still have a lot to work through or they're kind of getting near the end of it. But because uh, for various reasons, like people tend to have a huge amount of equity in the property that they own in China. Um, the banks are basically under state control, right? So the, 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 uh, the regulators can let them work their way through the debt problem over a number of years, they spread it out over five or six years. Um, I think are those are the main reasons why uh, the yes. way it worked itself out in China are different from the United States. Yeah. So, you know, on the one hand, you think two trillion, that sounds like a lot of money, which it is. On the other, it's 6% of outstanding bank loans. Um, so to your point, uh, then it becomes, how do the regulators want to treat these bad loans? Uh, you know, can we sweep them under the rug? work them out over the next five, six years, 10 years, which is, by the way, what China's done cycle after cycle. They did this with the SOE consolidation of, of, uh, of the 90s. Um, they did this with a lot of the manufacturing debt of 2007, 2008. Um, now, the numbers keep getting bigger, so they can't do this forever. But at 6% of bank loans, they can still sort of extend and pretend for, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, now, this doesn't mean that you should run out and buy Chinese real estate, uh, you know, that the sector is consolidating. Um, and the whole business model of the property developers is being torn to pieces because the, the whole business model of property developers was always, you know, get money up front. You know, you, you buy a plot of land, you, you, you get a nice office in town, you, you put up some nice, uh, uh, you know, plans, people, then people put a deposit. Um, and with that deposit, you, you leverage the deposit and you borrow to, to build the building. Um, today, because so many property developers have gone bust, nobody wants to put the deposit down. Um, and because nobody puts the deposit down, um, you know, the, the, the model doesn't work. Um, and so it's funny because in 2008 in the U.S., in essence, you had a run on the banks. Uh, you know, a lot of people didn't feel comfortable 
lending to banks anymore, especially the banks didn't feel comfortable lending to each other. In China, it's a run on the property developers. Nobody wants to keep their money at, at a property developer. Um, and I think that, you know, the government could st come in any time and stop this by creating a sort of FDIC of property developers mm -hmm. saying, you know, once you put your money at a, at, with the developer, there's a government guarantee and the developer has to pay an insurance company. Just like in the 1930s in the US, you created the FDIC to, to deal with all the, the bank runs. The government could do that, but doesn't because I think deep down it wants the consolidation in real estate. Deep down, the government, you know, they wanted this outcome. You know, they, they wanted, they never liked the property developers. Uh, they always thought they were sort of pariahs and, you know, Donald Trump like characters. Well, I, uh, I would say that, the, you know, a, a lot of the property development activity, although it made certain people rich, it wasn't necessarily developing the technological or industrial capability of the country very much. And secondly, it led to all kinds of problems with local governments raising money by just selling off property. And that sort of caused all kinds of, you know, local problems, less control from the center. And I guess now that so, some of those local governments are in financial trouble right now. So. Well, it's uh, and I think that's really to your point. That's really why the government ended up cracking down on real estate. If you go back a few years, there were just too many local governments saying, "Oh, you know, the uh, the, the Chinese saying is the 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 mountain is tall and the emperor is far away," uh, and there were too many local guys ruling their fiefdom uh, with massive local corruption, of course, because you know the 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 easiest way to get rich in China for the longest time was to convince a mayor to repurpose some agricultural land or common land into private property developer land and sell that to your private property developer buddy who you know would then give you a fat envelope um so it was really at the source of much corruption and and the corruption in china did end up being a real real problem you know post the big stimulus of 2008 there were simply you know too many mayor's son wrapping their ferraris around trees uh, uh, yes, at, yes. at 2 a.m but but you know there were there were literally a, a number of these events uh and it does look really bad for, for the party um and you know the the anti-corruption i think a lot of people in the western world envisage china you know as as this dictator where you have this sort of remote ruling class that follows policies that are sometimes hard to explain um uh, and that ends up being very self-serving, et cetera. In a sense, um, sometimes almost an image that makes it look like North Korea. Uh, now, China is not a democracy, no doubt about it, but it's also not North Korea. Um, and the Chinese leadership actually spends a lot of time uh, doing surveys of what people think and what people, and more importantly, what people complain about. And so if people complain about high property prices, they actually tackle that issue. If people complain about corruption, then they will tackle that issue. Um, and, um, and so it's not an unresponsive dictatorship where it's like, oh, I made it to the top. Now I'm just going to get <laughs> fed. I'm going to get fed grapes and, you know, go hang out on a yacht in Saint Tropez. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's not exactly like that. And so anyway, they did tackle the, the real estate developers. They're, they're still tackling them. Frankly, they're not helping them out. Um, so, this has had an impact on growth, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but again, the Chinese economy is not imploded. Yeah. So w w would you say they're toward the end of this uh, real estate, are you solving this real estate problem? Or are they still right at the beginning? What, how many more years of this do you think uh, we're going to have? I think the China's in a, in a transition phase. And like, you know, I, Xi Jinping's been very vocal about, you know, wanting to obviously push technology really hard. We talked about all this, the kids moving into STEM, et cetera, um, about how wealth creation has to come from, uh, for, you know, beefing up tech, beefing up industry, beefing up manufacturing, beefing up China's exports. Um, and in the past five years, China's done remarkably well in that space, actually. Um, when you think of it, China's had to endure uh, a couple things. Well, it's had to endure a real estate bust. It's had to endure a yen at 150. You know, J Japan. Japan is one of the biggest industrial powerhouses in yep. the world. Yep. And it's got it's got a currency that is just stupidly, stupidly undervalued. You know, I was I was in Japan a few months ago. Um, you go. It used to be that if you wanted to go out for dinner in Tokyo, you had to get a second mortgage on your house. 
it was like so expensive uh now tokyo is the most the, the cheapest yeah it's like a developing country the <laughs> it's the cheap i mean you go for lunch in tokyo like a really nice lunch it's gonna cost you 15 bucks i, I think um, i think quality adjusted the, the you know eating out dining out in say tokyo or anywhere in japan is like got to be the best deal in the world right now because you have the, the highest quality no levels about it. and the prices are way down because of the yen at least if you're an american it's no, the, no yeah. doubt about it yeah no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Look, in New York today for 20 bucks, you don't get, you don't get a sandwich. Uh, I mean, you don't. Yeah. Um, and you get like a, a really good meal in, in, in Tokyo, which is sort of for anybody who spent time in Asia is mind blowing because it always used to be like Tokyo. Oh, right. shoot, I'm going to go there and yeah, everything's going to be so expensive. To, to your point, uh, so I, think, so I think you wanted to say that the, the manufacturers and high tech companies in China are competing against a very weak yen yet. They're yeah. taking market share, uh, have huge trade surpluses. And so it's obviously exactly. for anybody else to try to compete with a Japan is, is extremely hard. And the fact that they can do it tells you something, right? So exactly. Uh, so when you think of it, they've had to deal with a super cheap yen, um, uh, the real estate bus we mentioned. And on top of that, the American um, um, war uh, <laughs> restrictions on CMI. Well, yeah, war, war. for any would like, but CMI, you know, CMI conductor restrictions and 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 whatever else. And with that, from nowhere five years ago, China's become the biggest car exporter in the world. Like, if you had told me the yen would be at 150, I would say every car in the world is going to be produced in Japan. Yep. But we're moving into a world where every car in the world is going to be produced in China. Yep. Because not only are they good at producing cheap internal combustion engine cars, but They've basically, at this point, they've cornered the electric car market. Um, and, and Europe is, is waking up to this because Europe was saying, oh, you know, by 2030, we want every new car sold to be, to be electric. And they're realizing, oh, hold on, if we do that, that means that we want every new car sold to be Chinese. Um, and, you know, which, you know, creates issues. Um, so, but beyond electric cars, you got railways, you got power plants, turbines. I mean, you name it. You know, five years ago, you mentioned that China's trade surplus has gone from 25 billion a month to 75 or 80 billion a month. Uh, and again, that's not because you and I decided to buy three times as many pairs of socks or three times as many, you know, plastic toys. Yep. Um, you know, in the past five years, China started exporting a bunch of stuff they never exported before. Um, you know, right now, China's in negotiations with Saudi Arabia to sell Saudi Arabia nuclear power plants. Now, as a Frenchman, I look at this and I wonder what the hell just happened here? Selling nuclear power plants is our, our business. You know, that's what that's what we do in France. That's like one of our key comparative advantages. And China comes in and undercuts us by two thirds. Um, sorry, they come in at two thirds of our price. Um, so undercut us by one third. It's it's mind blowing. Um, and you know, building cars, building nuclear power plants, uh, building railroads, that's complicated stuff. Yep. Right. I mean, it's again, it's not plastic toys anymore. You know, when I, um, when I when I talk to Americans, uh, a lot of the most anti-China people, they want to say, okay, this is all stolen. You guys stole all this IP and technology. And I'm sure some of that happened. But even if you stole stuff without a very powerful human capital and tech infrastructure basis, you're not going to be able to compete across all these different industries going forward. If, if all they did was steal and you stop them from stealing, you're going to get back ahead of them. But it looks the other way. It looks like they're getting ahead of us now. So um, very okay, different so what, from how what, it's what perceived it here. All right, so go ahead. I hate the stealing of IP argument, to be honest. Uh, I, I, uh, it's sort of one of my bugbears. I always say, okay, look, China's become the biggest EV producer in the world. Like, what did they steal from whom? Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, you know. Yeah, Tesla uh, buys their batteries this, from them, right? So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tesla buys their It's like, who, who did they steal and from whom to, to, to do this? Uh, now, you could say they stole it from Tesla, but actually – Tesla early on in its uh, uh, life said, I'm putting all, all everything up there on the web, everything we've done, and anybody can look at it because we want the world to move to an electric car format. Um, like, you know, who did, who did they steal to do this? Um, you know, nuclear power plants, they build their own nuclear program from, from scratch. Like this is, you know, everybody, have, it's really hard to steal nuclear stuff because of all the national security around it, et cetera. So like if... If we want to say China stole the nuclear secrets, um, then that means that we've got some serious espion like espionage leaks yeah. going on in our own countries. I, 
Uh, to be honest, when I talk to people like that, I don't even want to fight that battle. I'll just say, look, let, let's, <laughs> let's, let's suppose they stole everything, but they have very competent people making use of what they stole. And going forward, just crying about it is not going to solve your problem because they're innovating new stuff, as with EVs, as you pointed out, right? So, or, or LIDAR but or something. It, yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying a little while ago. It's like, look, if China produces more engineers every year than there are engineers in the U.S., um, how can we not expect to eventually be bypassed? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, to say, oh, they're just stealing stuff. It's like, so what are all these people doing? Like, you know, these literally yeah. millions of engineers yeah. that are getting churned out every year. Yeah. If you're um, if, if you're a technologist like a Silicon Valley guy or an academic scientist, and you've just been over there and you've interacted with people, you realize that they're sharp. You realize they're comparable. The graduates from their schools are comparable to the grad or better than the graduates from Western schools. So um, you pretty quickly realize. Well, in fairness, real. yeah, the graduates. So my younger my uh, my uh, I've got a young niece who's currently doing a, a PhD. In um, in biomedical engineering at uh, Imperial College in, in London, she's she's really bright. Um, she's the hope of our family, etc. You know, we, we all believe she's we all believe she's going to cure cancer. Um, she's she's terrific. But you know, half of the people doing Imperial at, 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 are Chinese. <laughs> like yeah. half of the people at Imperial College, which is like a, a STEM based school in in the U.S., yep. are Chinese, and the half that's not Chinese is Indian. Yep. By the way, when we we count, oh. You know, all the STEM people, like China produces more than there are in the U.S., et cetera. We also have to count that the ones being produced in the U.S., a lot of them are going to go back to China anyway. Yep. Um, yep. We, we've, we have undervalued STEM in our schooling system, not at the university level, but from, from a much earlier age. Absolutely. Uh, so that when kids, kids come in at university, most don't even look at STEM. Yep. They're just like blow right past the only thing that kids still look at is computer sciences yep exactly but how many how many of our kids still do chemistry or physics or you know you mentioned material sciences or all these things like yeah he does don't don't get me started on this because um you know most <laughs> u.s universities actually they used to have an algebra 2 requirement so this is like high school level algebra uh that you had to have mastery of that to get your bachelor's degree and they dropped that because so few students or so many students on campus were having trouble passing that kind of remedial math class. They just waived the requirement now. So, so it is really a problem here in the United States. Um, you know, this is, would not be the case at Duke, but at many public universities, it really is an issue. It's an impediment to graduation to require them to have some basic knowledge of math and, and science. So, but remember, um, rem remember, they steal our secrets. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we can't, we can't pass maths, but they come and steal our secrets. So let's, let me ask you something that's been puzzling me for a long time. So when you compare the size of the PRC economy and the U S economy, there are two commonly used ways of doing it. One is PPP adjusted. The other one is nominal based on exchange rates. But I've always thought that even the nominal num so the PPP thing, let's not get into that right now, but. The nominal thing, I've always understood that the way the Chinese government reports what it categorizes toward the nominal GDP number is qualitatively different from the way the U.S. does it. So in other words, services provided by the state, which people don't pay for, are not included in that number, even though it is a form of economic activity for the country. Maybe you could just comment on how you think about the relative size of the two economies. So... Um... <laughs> We could go down this well, this rabbit hole, and uh, that'd be a three-hour conversation. There's, there's, there's so many branches we can go down, but to try to narrow it down, let's stick to, to nominal GDP. Forget the purchasing parity adjustment because that that opens up different cans of worms as well. Stick to nominal GDP. Um, if we stick to nominal GDP, the U.S. economy is still about a third bigger than the Chinese economy. Um, now, here's here's where it gets interesting. Is you know, if you think of the GDP as having, you know, our, our primaries or agriculture, mining, uh, manufacturing, industry, um, et cetera, so, so secondary uh, sector, and then your tertiary sector being your services industry. So if you break it down this way, 
even though the Chinese economy is a third smaller than the U.S., industry, your secondary sector, is 60% bigger than your um, than the U.S. Um, so Chinese today, manufacturing and industry in China is 60% bigger than the U.S. already. And that gap is growing for all the reasons we highlighted, the, the, the STEM kids, the... the uh, the fact that industry is an ecosystem. I mean, you're you're from Michigan. I don't need to, to, to tell you this, right? You like yeah. you you got one factory and it's here because you, it's next to the other factory that does this, which is next to the other factory that does that, and they all feed into each other. And um, and like once you manage to get that ecosystem going, it can grow quite fast and it grows on itself. And and if you don't have that ecosystem, um, now, the other thing about manufacturing, of course, is you need the engineers, you need the STEM kids, and you need the workers who are trained to be workers in an, in, in an industry that trains the next set of workers, right? Like the 40-year-old the trains the 20-year-old who comes in and who passes on skill. Uh, and to some extent, this is what the U.S. has lost, right? Um, and the deindustrialization, which is so that's not that easy to, to replicate. You've seen, you see this with TSMC. You know, the U.S. is giving huge subsidies to TSMC to, to move their, their, their fabs to, uh, to the U S and TSMC keeps saying, we can't find the workers. Yeah. Like we, we literally can't find the, the, the guys who, my, you know, my wife's family is from, Ta been, my wife's family is from uh, Taiwan. So I hear all the inside stuff about how frustrated these Taiwanese companies are trying to get American workers to perform the way that people are used to performing, you know, in Taiwan. Well, Fox Foxconn's another example. I remember when Trump got elected, Foxconn said, oh, we're going to open an, uh, Wisconsin. a big plant in, in Wisconsin. We're going to open one in Indiana. Five years later, there's nada. Right. Um, so, so I think they could, but I, I think they couldn't get the workers. I think you're emphasizing that as far as manufacturing and doing physical things, the Chinese economy is really qualitatively like almost 2x in some sense larger yeah. than the US. But and what so, I'm. And so then and so I was going to come to that point. Yeah. So now you come to the, to the services. Yeah, you come to to the services industry, um, and the Chinese economy uh, is like twenty percent of the U.S. economy. So the service industry in China is when you look through the GDP numbers. Now you could say the service industry in the U.S. is disproportionately big, uh, because you know it's as a European coming to the U.S. You're always it's it's always dumbfounding how great the U.S. is at commercializing things. You know you go to I'm always, you know, you go to an American football game where you're mentioning sports, you know, you, you can't turn around without being offered something to buy, without uh, being made to spend money um, in a way that doesn't happen in a European stadium. So the service industry in the U.S. is so great at, you know, at pushing things on the consumer, et cetera. It's the financial industry is obviously a really big part of GDP. The healthcare industry is a really big part of GDP, um, all of which we don't really have in China. Um, so the service industry in China, so on the one hand, you could say, oh, the U.S. service industry is too big, uh, but it seems to work for the U.S. So who's to say that it's too big? Can I ask uh, you about that, though? Because it seems like in terms of consumer purchasing, the efficiency of, oh, if I want to buy something and get it delivered to my house or I want to shop efficiently and find the right air conditioner for my apartment that yeah. fits my window, it doesn't seem like the consumer has any less efficiency or range of choice in China than in the U S so no, yeah, yeah that, go, that part go is good. Yeah. No, no, that part is good in China. You can, you know, you go on Taobao, you find anything you want, it gets delivered. Um, the e-commerce, in fact, you know, China is the one country outside of the U S that has built a proper internet slash tech ecosystem. You know, right. it's really, uh, you would think India would have it, given that they have so many engineers. Right. Um, but you know, the, the backend infrastructure in India isn't that great, right? right. The, the roads, the logistics, so, etc. So to account for this fact that I think you said that if you just look at the service sector, it's t China's service sector by this kind of standard it's minuscule, twenty percent of the U.S. Yet it yeah. seems like any kind of transaction that I actually want to involve myself in in China, whether it's trading stock or buying an air conditioner or a car, it, it seems like it's just as developed and just as efficient as yep. what we have in the U.S. So, so, so you, what, what is that five to one ratio there that you're talking about? So I think first it's a poor country. Um, and 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar. I, I could send you pieces on this. Uh, there was a French economist called Aftalion who talked about the acceleration phenomena. And the idea is um, income is distributed along a bell-shaped curve, right? Um, typically in a country. So, you know, if in China, the average income is $10,000, Everybody makes between almost everybody makes between five and fifteen. You'll have a small tail of people who make less than five, and a small tail of people who make more than fifteen. Now, the reason this matters is there's thresholds for consumption. Mm -hmm. So, at two thousand dollars, everybody buys a smartphone. At thousand dollars, everybody buys a TV. Two thousand dollars, everybody buys a smartphone. Ten thousand dollars, they buy a car. And the more like everything below fifteen is all about goods. Everything post fifteen is all about services. Once you start making more than $15,000, you spend more money on education. You spend more money on healthcare. You spend more money on, on financial services. You start buying mutual funds or open a brokerage account. Um, now, again, so you think of your bell-shaped curve. What's happening in China today is that everybody is in, is in that consumption still bucket of things. So to your point, oh, I make a little more money, I'm going to buy an air conditioner. Oh, I make a little more money, I'm going to buy a microwave or I'm going to buy a car. Um, and by the way, that curve, this is why it's the acceleration phenomena. As it moves to the right, you know, as incomes grow over time, the area that, you know, China was a great example for this. You know, in 2000, China was selling roughly 2 million cars a year. By 2007, it was selling 18 million cars a year. Because the curve had shifted mm -hmm. where the area of people earning $10,000, so all of a sudden, it doesn't, if the curve shifts 20% to the right, your demand for cars doesn't go up 20%. It goes up 7x. Um, so, you know, a lot of the services the Americans spend money on, again, healthcare, finance, education, which, by the way, are really big bills in the U.S., you know, I, I don't need to tell you the cost of a U.S. education, yes. uh, nor, nor the cost of U.S. healthcare. Um, Things that in China are essentially free. Now, you could say they're not free for everybody. Um, the government has to pay some of it, et cetera. But to your point, that doesn't really get reflected really well in the national statistics. So, that, so you know. So that was, the, that was the point someone had made to me specifically that if you're getting your health care kind of free from or quasi free from the government system, when they report numbers that would otherwise be folded into GDP as you know, the, the healthcare that I personally purchase in the US, that number is just absent in the accounting, even That's though right. there is a doctor providing that service to yep. the person in China. And, and similarly, and that, yeah, go ahead. Similarly yeah, yeah. With that and if you look, I think, and I think if you look at the US, healthcare is, is, is what? It's now 18% of yep. US GDP yep. or something, yep. quoting from memory, but yep. it's a big number. Yep. Um, so if instead of an 18, you've got a two. Right. You know, and, uh, and, and, and education, if instead of a, yeah. and the college so, going percentage, so the percentage of high school graduates who leave high school and go to college in China is now about 60%. So it's similar to yeah. the US level. So it doesn't seem like they're actually lacking educational services in China, but somehow the accounting makes it such that it appears that part of their economy is much, much smaller than in the United States. So that somebody made this point to me and I was just curious whether yeah what and, how big is that distortion in the comparison oh that's definitely it's definitely a big one and your u.s co and your u.s college student pays 50 grand a year 60 grand a year um your your you you know your chinese college student pays <laughs> two thousand or something to be honest, yeah well no no like two thousand renminbi um it's it's you know it's a rounding error yeah um and so uh yeah so i so you are, in essence, comparing apples and oranges, but there is also the element of as China, you know, as incomes continue to grow now, granted, they might not be growing as fast as they did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but they are still growing. So as incomes grow, you are still going to see more money being spent in tourism, more money being spent on entertainment, more money being spent on education, on healthcare. Um, because yes, you can go to the public healthcare, but the reality is, you know, rich people don't want to do that. They now want, right. no, but it's true. You know, it, like if you have a chance to, to go to a private clinic, you're going to pick that over the, the no, it's fair. Healthcare. Totally yeah. fair. Uh, and, and so, so money gets, starts to get spent there for now. It's a small minority of people, but you know, in, in five years time, that number will be up five X, 10 X. Um, and, and so I highlight this 
because this is also China's challenge. You know, we mentioned, we talked earlier how China's graduating, you know, it's going to be graduating 12.3 million kids this year, 11.7 last year. These are kids who want jobs, you know, in an air conditioned office with a phone and a laptop. They don't want to be, you know, pouring concrete or, or beating pavements with a sledgehammer. Um, and the problem for the government is it's not like there's 12 million guys working in the service industry in China today that are going to be retiring at the end of this year to make room for the 20 mil, 12 million kids coming in. So, you know, if you look at the government 20 years ago, the challenge was you had 20 million guys leave the farm for the city every year, guys and girls leave, leave the cities for the, for the, the cities every year, leave the farm for the cities. Um, and so what they did with these guys is, okay, well, we need to build a road here and we need to build a power plant here and a subway line over there. Now, transforming a farmer into a bricklayer, that's, that, that's actually not that hard, right? Yep. It's, um, but now, the, now, you know, technically what you'd want is somebody to say, okay, we need an insurance company here and a sports marketing business there and a private hospital here. But the government can't really do that. Right. It's not like the government can say, oh, let's build a sports marketing business here. Uh, you know, that's it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, that's going to come from the bottom up. Um, and here, the only thing the government can do is create the right conditions for, for that to occur. But it'll need to happen because if you're going to graduate 12 million kids a year, you need to find jobs for them. Yeah. My, my guess is that this reported very high youth unemployment number is just because so many kids go to college now in China. It was such a rapid transition from very few going to, you know, 60% of the kids going to college. Now, all of those kids expect to have white collar, you know, knowledge worker type jobs, and there just aren't that many available in the economy for them right now. So some of them are going to have to just bite down, bite the bullet and do something which is a little bit uh, less glamorous than what they thought they were going to college for. So there's that, but also remember that all these kids are the fruits of two generation of one child policy. Yep. Yep. Um, so, uh, so they have four grandparents, two parents, no cousins, no brothers and sisters. So they actually also have the option of staying at home. And a lot of them do, um, like of waiting for the right job. Yep. Um, because, you know, if you have five kids, <laughs> you tell the kids, you're not staying at home. Yeah. You kids are out of here. Yep. Uh, you know, make, go, go make your way which was always the way in China, by the way, right? And that's why, you know, for years, all these guys were leaving the farm because if you were one of five kids on a farm, uh, you know, if you divide the land five ways, you're left with, you know, not a lot of land. It's not economical. Um, and so, you know, for years and years and years, people in China really had no choice but to leave. Uh, sometimes they left for the Chinese cities, but sometimes they left much further afield. They went all across Southeast Asia to the Americas to, you know, they, they, to Australia, there, there really wasn't much choice. Um, but now there is actually, there, there is no sort of gun to their head. Like they can stay at home yep. and, 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 and a lot of them do. So this is, this is something that is going to have to work itself through the system in it. And it may take some period of time really for the labor markets to equilibrate properly. So did you ever read a book, um, came out, uh, uh just after the 2008 crisis called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Sure, yeah. It was a, yeah, it was a fun read. Um, and one of the points he makes, you know, he looks at the, you know, odd things that, that occur, like, you know, how all the hockey players are born in November and December and how, uh, and how all the tech guys, you take Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Scott McNeely, uh, Paul Allen, Steve Wozniak, like all of them, um, like this was sort of the first wave of the big tech founders the guys who did Microsoft, Apple, Sun Microsystem, Oracle, um, all these guys were all born within 12 months of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the point um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell makes is, look, it was basically the first PC sort of came out when these guys were 20 years old. Um, and so if you were like already 25 or 28, chances are you were married. And so you stayed at your job at IBM or at uh, – General Electric or wherever, and you know these guys they fiddle around the computer, etc. But I actually think Gladwell missed the bigger point because I think if you were 24, 25, you still weren't married. The bigger point was that all these guys were also college dropouts, mm -hmm. like literally, like almost all of them, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, etc. And they were in college 
they dropped out in 74, 75 when the U.S. was going through a terrible, really bad recession. Mm -hmm. Now, when I went to college, I went to Duke and, you know, the deal was pretty simple. You keep your head down, you do your work, you get good grades. Then maybe you get recruited by Morgan Stanley or by McKenzie or by Goldman Sachs. And then, you know, you work hard while you're there. And then at the end of it all, you know, you'll have the Hamptons house and, you know, and, yep. and the sports car, you know, if you keep your head down and just do well, there was no real reason to really go out of your way. Take risk. You know, you take risk. Like, why would you, right? This yep. is like, if, if I just stay in the rails, everything's good. Um, and, but in 74, 75, that wasn't an option. If you were at Harvard in 74, 75, you'd like, well, what the hell? Like, I'm going to stay here. There's no job with IBM at the end of this. And there's no job with GE at the end of this. So yeah. I might as well try my thing. Um, and so I think that's what's going to happen in China. So you see a lot of entrepreneurs coming out of this group of kids right now that are dealing with this high unemployment rate? I think you will. You know, one, uh, one of the jokes we, we tell each other in Asia is that the tragedy of Asia is that Japan's a profoundly socialist country on which capitalism was imposed. And China's a profoundly <laughs> capitalist country yes. on which socialism was imposed. Yeah, I agree. And that both are, that both are drifting back to their natural order of things. Yeah. Um, and if you've spent time in Japan or China, it, it rings true. It rings true. Like I, China is a profoundly capitalist yeah. place. I agree with you 100%. Uh, and, that the Japanese are much more collectivistic than the Chinese yeah. and even more orderly and rule obeying. And the Chinese are much more nat more likely to be natural entrepreneurs than Japanese, actually. Yeah. 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 And by the way, uh, look at it, look at historically, just, uh, we mentioned how, you know, through the 19th and 20th century, a lot of Chinese people had no choice but to export themselves. Um, they ended up running all the businesses in Southeast Asia. Like, you know, you, you go to Indonesia, you go to Thailand, you go to Vietnam, uh, like all, all the business like leaders, empires, et cetera, it was, it was all Chinese. Yep. Like uh, chi China is, is a deeply entrepreneurial culture. Uh, the Chinese culture is a deeply entrepreneurial culture. Yep. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and come back to this trade surplus. So China's running this ginormous trade surplus right now. Looks like it's set to continue for some time. U.S. is always a deficit country. Um, how do you see the flows of money? How are how is the U.S. going to fund its uh, debt obligations? What do the Treasury auctions look like lately? Do you have any? I know you have some views on how this is going to uh, shake out. Well, lately they've been looking ugly. Um, the, the 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 simple answer is your last question: How, how have the Treasury auctions been looking? And the answer is they've been looking ugly because look, the, the U.S. is now. Uh, it's the U.S. is four percent of the global population. It's uh, sixty percent of global budget deficits. If you include, oh, sorry, forty percent of global budget deficits and sixty percent of global current account deficits. So you you had all all the world's budget deficits. You had all the world's current account deficits. And so the U.S. needs to constantly attract foreign capital, um, which it you know historically had it never had any problem doing, but never in those quantities. Um, what is really quite unusual about the current cycle is that you have a U.S. economy that's growing by 8.5% nominal GDP, uh, where you have full and full employment. Like, you want a job in the U.S. today, you've got a job. Um, and basically, at the peak of its boom, the U.S. is running budget deficits of 8% of GDP. Uh, that, that's what's completely you know, unprecedented yeah. relative to, to any other period in history. Um, and I think it's made, starting to make the market more and more uncomfortable. Because again, the numbers are getting bigger and bigger and so bigger. The surplus uh, countries that could recycle their uh, flows back into the U.S. seem to be countries that the U.S. is directly antagonizing, like China, uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, they're I, I, you know, like what's happening in Gaza with the U.S. backing those activities. It's gonna. It seems to me going to make the Saudis less and less likely to want to show up at the Treasury auction and buy a bunch of U.S. debt, right? So. How, how do you see all well, that? You saw, you saw last week. You saw last week what I think was a massive event. The Central Bank of Saudi Arabia signed a swap line with uh, the PBOC, the, yes. the Chinese Central Bank. Yes. Now, why, why the hell would they do that? You know why? Why they've got a pegged currency to the dollar, um, and they've got uh, what they sell is price in dollars, right? Uh, oil. Um, so why would they need a swap line with China? Uh, you know. Signing a swap line with China is, in essence, saying 
we're going to need renminbi now why would saudi need renminbi for um is saudi's trying starting to signal that they might depeg to the us dollar that they might start signing long-term deals with china for oil and and renminbi i don't know the answer what i know is they announced this this uh this currency swap and to me that seems like one of the most important uh monetary developments of of the recent years uh and surprisingly like nobody's really commenting on it and you know i've been trying to get my head around it yeah i Um, i think think it's a momentous event i think those developments are super interesting and in fact i think it's becoming more and more plausible that uh, Saudi could get security guarantees from Russia and China, just as it has now from the US, because their military technologies and presence are, are going to be sufficient to guarantee uh, Saudi security eventually, so that they, they could shift over to a different patron uh, than the United States. Well, uh, I think it's a bit, I think it's not so much security guarantees, but for me, the, the, one of the biggest developments of, uh, of the past year, again, that we didn't really mention and much in the Western world is is how China got Iran and Saudi Arabia around the table yes. to shake hands and, and make a peace deal. You know, in essence, this was like the Camp David Accord, um, except it wasn't brokered by the U.S. It was brokered by China. And you know what China basically said to both Saudi and, and Iran is it, it said, "Look, I'm your biggest trading partner, both of you. Like you now sell more to me than to anybody else, and I want to do more business with you." Um, and I want to invest in your country, but I'm not going to do that if you guys are going to go to war with each other. Mm-hmm. Because if you go to war with each other, I'm going to lose on both sides. Yep. Um, so, you know, if if you guys get along, we can do a lot of great stuff together. Um, now, the reality is Iran, the only reason Iran survives is at this point China. Um, and economically, you know, Saudi Arabia tried to crush it. The U.S. tried to crush it. But given that it's got... China's backing now it's it's it, you know it's 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 not going to it's not going to get crushed um so i think saudi re- realizing this says okay um you, china can always put pressure on iran to do what they want so i might as well get a, and if you're saudi you only have one enemy it's iran mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. uh you're not worried about israel israel's right. not going to come attack saudi uh, so your only enemy is, and you're no longer worried about Russia or the Soviet Union like you were in the past. So your only enemy is Iran. So, you know, if you can cut a deal with China to cut a deal with Iran, that takes care of your biggest problem. And I think that's what we've seen. I, I think you've mentioned that instead of recycling its surpluses into dollars or treasuries, it looks like China might be building up oil reserves or energy reserves uh, with those surpluses. Is, is that part of the picture here? I think it is. I think it is. It's very tough to know what exactly China is doing with its reserves, but there is something indeed, you know, China's got trade surplus, like we mentioned, 75, 80 billion a month, but, but, uh, but China's actually not only not been buying treasuries, but letting its existing treasuries expire. So it's, it's basically using fewer and fewer treasuries out there. Um, sorry, stocking fewer and fewer treasuries. Now, if you're China, you know, why would you have treasuries in the first place? Well, you bought treasuries to, cushion the you know your your potential hits on on commodities right or if if ever tomorrow uh you know you, you either can't get access to dollars or commodity prices go through the roof for whatever reason then you sell your treasuries and you buy the commodities you need but if you're china and especially following the western world's grabbing of russia's treasuries if you're china you think hold on i've been accumulating treasuries in the case i needed oil that was really the main thing. So maybe I just accumulate oil. Like, you know, why the intermediate step where I, I make myself dependent on the willingness and ability of the U.S. to deliver me my money mm-hmm. when tomorrow, you know, they've shown that they can take it away in a heartbeat. So I think the, the nationalization of Russia's reserves was the biggest uh, foreign policy own goal uh <laughs> you know since you know since the probably the start yeah. of the iraq war um you know we, i think we we cut our nose to spite our faces we western policymakers wanted to be seen to be doing something to punish russia um and what we did is we said okay let's 
tell the biggest commodity producer in the world that they can't use U.S. dollars. And I think we thought like this, they won't be able to sell their commodities. And we never stopped to think, well, they'll sell them in another currency. Yeah, exactly. Which is exactly what's happened. And I think any five-year-old would have figured that one out, but, but somehow rode right past it. So I remember, I think five or 10 years ago, China didn't even have a strategic oil reserve. And have they, have they publicly declared how big that's going to be and, and how far along they are in filling it up? No, no. And China's very, that's like complete top state secret. And, um, and so I think there's, there's a lot of reserve accumulation, um, at the importer level, you know, the, the, the Sinopex of, of this world. Uh, I think they've been building more and more sort of storage capacity, uh, but they're, they're definitely building strategic petroleum reserves. If, if you look at, you know, the, the, the official consumption numbers, the official production numbers and the import numbers, China's probably been importing a million barrel per day uh, too much, but somewhere between half, half a million and a million barrel per day too much for the past couple of years, uh, which again, I think if you're China makes perfect sense, yeah. you've got too many dollars, you don't yeah. know what to do with them. Um, and at the same time, you're living in a world with much more geopolitical uncertainty. You've got the US that you feel is out to get you. You've got a war between Russia and Ukraine. I mean, tomorrow for all you know, and I don't think it's gonna happen, but if you're China, you know, you plan for the worst, you hope for the best, you plan for the worst. Tomorrow, again, in, in China's point of view, but what if Russia sort of devolves into a massive civil war? You know, Putin dies, is killed, falls. You had a sort of glimpse of it with, uh, you know, the, the Wagner it. groups march on to Moscow. Yeah. yeah you're like, well, I thought I woke up that Saturday morning. I thought, oh, oh my God, I, you know, I don't own enough oil. If, like, if, if Russia starts to, to collapse into a civil war, you know, it's like, or, you know, what price oil? So if you're China and you think, okay, maybe that's only a 5% possibility, but. If it does, it's going to completely screw my economy. Why wouldn't you stock oil? I, I think uh, especially it's, if you got too many dollars that you know what to do. With. I think it's a no-brainer. They they had to at some point build a strategic reserve. It was kind of just their development outpaced their you know uh, yes, scale risk. their ability to do so. What's interesting though is when they get to the point where they've reached a reasonable level for that petroleum reserve. SPR. Will yeah, will they continue to just? stock of oil as a store of value or something because they don't want to own treasuries that that and when they get to that point it becomes a more kind of interesting question it's like not for free anymore right um no no to, to your point look there is a cost of building an spr right you you know you got to pay the storage and it costs money you don't want to just do it for, for, for forever so yeah at that point what will they do with the extra dollars my guess is they'll it'll be a past the parcel game they'll be buying assets um you know, they'll be buying copper mines in Africa. They'll be buying, um, you know, fields in Argentina to, to, to grow food. You know, wh whatever asset comes up for sale, they'll, they'll pick up. Because uh, on a 20-year view, owning a copper mine in Zaire or in uh, Zambia or in Mozambique might be a smarter trade than owning a U.S. Treasury anyway. Yeah. So uh, at least for them to the to the trillion dollar question, uh, not to put you on the spot here, but this turbulence we see in the treasury auctions, at, at what point does it really become a real fundamental problem for the U.S. to to fund its deficits? So I think before it becomes a problem, the you know you still have one more bullet, and that the Fed can come in and monetize a lot of the debt, like once. Once the government, U.S. government, starts hitting real funding issues, the Fed will step in, uh, and then the U.S. dollar will go down. Um, and initially, that first drop in the U.S. dollar will feel great because the U.S. dollar is overvalued. We were discussing how cheap Japan is, yeah. and you know how China's got a seventy-five billion trade surplus. You know, initially it, it'll feel good. It'll, you know, and uh, a lot of sort of industrial-linked states. You know, your Michigans, your Indianas, your um, your Pennsylvanias, where by and large, the Rust Belt states where the elections are decided very often anyway, mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of increasingly the swing states. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all these states will feel great. So initially, it'll, it'll feel fine. Eventually, though, that will catch up with higher inflation, weaker currency, you know, debt printing. Uh, you'll get higher inflation unless, of course, the U.S. starts to tighten its fiscal belt. But, you know, right now, there seems to be little appetite for that. Yeah. Um, so... 
what seems more likely to me is that, you know, at some point in the next couple of years, uh, or maybe even much earlier than that, the Fed steps back in, monetizes the debt, and then, you know, from there, um, dollar goes down, and that creates the next boom. Um, but on the, on the, during that boom, if the U.S. doesn't tighten its fiscal belt, then you start running into trouble. So that, that Fed stepping in to monetize the debt, so I guess their balance sheet is like $11 trillion right now or something like this, $12 trillion. What, what does the Fed actually have on its balance sheet? Is it- uh, oh, uh, from the top of my head, no, I think it's a bit lower than that. I think, uh, uh, are you, I think you're in $9 trillion. Oh, $9 trillion. I can't okay. remember from the top of my head. I'll have to check. I can't remember from the top of my at head, what, sorry. At what point do macro guys like yourself start to say, wait a minute, flashing red light, <laughs> there's this serious problem here. You know, most, I think a lot of macro guys, um, you have a framework and then you wait for the momentum to, to, to start confirming your, your framework. Um, and I think a lot of people have always talked about the problem of U.S. debt. Uh, and so far, you know, the U.S. treasuries have sold off, no doubt. Uh, the, the, next, the next leg should be the U.S. dollar. Now, you could tell me, well, it started, the U.S. dollar has been weak the past three, four weeks, but I think you need to see a little more sort of downside momentum, key levels being broken, and then, then the macro guys come in and, and, and start you know, piling on the trade. I see. But we're not there yet. Okay. That, that's my main worry. You know, I've worked all my life building up some you know, uh, net worth for my kids, mostly because I don't really spend the money. But the, worst, the main thing I have to navigate is this sort of I don't know, next 10 years of 20 years of de-dollarization so that, you know, my nest egg preserves its real value for my kids. That's, that's my main worry in terms of, in terms of financial strategy. Well, it sounds like you've got the AR 15s. So that's a good first step. <laughs> I, I guess those won't can goods. Yeah. Canned goods and weapons. They never depreciate. Yeah. Those are yeah. always worth, uh, always worth something. No, look, jokes, jokes aside. Um, I think w- what you highlight uh, and I'm sorry to be flippant about this because this is a real issue. Uh, the, the, the issue you highlight, I didn't mean to, to sound flippant. It's a real problem because uh, for the past 30, 40 years, you could count on Fink's income to, to, to protect a good bit of your wealth. And you know, for the past two, three years, that hasn't been the case. And there's been a brutal wake-up call for, for a lot of investors that well, you know, how much capital could be destroyed. We've just had a really horrible bear market. And you know, CNBC talks all days about stocks. Um, and, you know, when you're at the gym or whatever and you're looking at the TV, you get the stock tickers go yeah. by, et cetera. But, but, you know, long dated bonds, like they've just wiped out 15 trillion of capital. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the, the bond bear market has wiped out 15 trillion of capital. That's, that's proper money. Um, has been serious capital destruction for a lot, a lot of savers. And a lot of savers who were so, you know, conservative savers. Uh, we didn't want to go out there on the risk curve and take too much risk, et cetera. And they've been absolutely butchered. Anyway, g- going back to your question, it does raise the question indeed. Like so far, the pain has been on the Fink's income. Um, do we leave it at that? And it's good that the pain's been taken and now we're, we're reset and, and we can start again, option one. Or option two, that was the first step. And the next step is, is the dollar. And the next step is the dollar because the U.S. government remains incontinent. Um, and uh, I think the options of option two is, is indeed there. So from there, you know, how do you protect portfolios? Uh, and so, you know, one of the things I, li- I like a lot, Latin American debts, you get high real rates. You, you have governments that are actually the polar opposite of ours. It's always the same story. You don't make your father's mistake. You make your grandfather's mistakes. Um, you know, in Latin America, they had inflation not that long ago. So as soon as inflation appears in the system, the central banks you know, bang and ministries of finance tighten fiscal policy because they know the long-term consequences. Meanwhile, in our countries, ours, you know, whether France or, or America, as when inflation reappeared, you know, all our policymakers were clapping like seals. They're like, yay, yay, inflation, you know, we want it higher for longer. You know, we're going we're gonna to like, you know, keep, keep this thing going. And, and you're wondering, are you trying to destroy people's wealth here? You know, what's, uh, what, what's going on? Uh, and the reality is they were, and, and they really still are, actually. Um, they really, 
keep following crazy fiscal policies because they feel that's how they're going to get reelected. Yeah. Um, they're buying your votes with your money. Yep. And and so to your point, um, they you know how do you protect yourself against that? Well, I think Latin American debt is one of them. Uh, I think real assets, you know, gold, etc., historically have proven to be to be uh, not bad. Um, you know, commodities is a way to protect yourself. But deep down, you know, if you if you go through the periods of, of big inflation, uh, you got absolutely crushed in bonds. Equities you made okay actually, because you know, I, you know, if if you don't pay up too much for the equity. You can still do okay. So I would say, you know, to answer your question, buy value stocks, buy commodities. You can also have some growth stocks in there as well, of course. Yeah. Buy Latin America debt uh, and buy some gold. And that, that may not hit it out of the park, but it should allow you to cushion the portfolio. That, that was a great answer to my question. I think the main problem I have is that, you know, for most of my life, you could buy the 60-40 portfolio and just go to sleep. And now you have to actually have to think and figure things out to actually stay ahead of things. No, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. But you know what? You don't, you don't get to pick the period you live in. No. No. So, Louis, I've, I've kept you a long time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I, it, it's, a, it's a dream come true for me to finally be able to talk to you and uh, hope, we can, hope we can stay in I've touch. I very much enjoyed it. Yeah. Absolutely. I've very much enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, uh, thanks a bunch for having me. I will, I'll maybe look you up if I'm in Hong Kong someday. Oh, please do. Please do. Or Beijing. We have an office up in Beijing. Oh, great. Either one. Yeah. I, I spent some time. I'm gonna be in, I think I'm going to be in China this summer, so uh, hopefully we can uh, meet in person at some point. I'm actually, I'm actually in Beijing. I'm actually in Beijing next week. Great. All right. 